Oda just revealed Shanks' father was in God Valley and destroyed Whitebeard. <laughs> And uh, can I get a update on Luffy versus Kizaru? Um, you know, some people in the comments have been saying that Yonkos are weaker than Admirals, and I'd just like to check on where they at. Where y'all at? It's not looking good, Bev. Kizaru might have been taken care of, but now Luffy has to face an immortal demon god fruit user in Saturn J. Garcia. I don't like where this is going. Using his demon power and summoning circle, Garcia had managed to take everyone off guard. However, his appearance gave Bonnie the opportunity to take revenge for what the Gorosays did to her father by stabbing him. As the vice admirals try to help Saturn, he says, nah, this is light work. I let her stab me because I could. So he he casually tells Bonnie to get out of the kitchen because she's not cooking. I mean, what did we tell you guys? Her no advanced hockey having ass ain't doing shit to one of the Gorosays. Absolutely useless. After taking the blade out from his body, Saturn's blood and wound disappear as if nothing had ever happened. Now, this could be explained through a few things. First is of course through the immortality surgery, which could have given him this extra buff. And the second being an innate power of the Ushiyoshi no Mi's zone awakening, which lets him heal wounds effortlessly. Because one of the aspects of an Ushi Oni IRL is that it can affect souls. So if he has power over his own soul through this fruit, then he can fix any bodily harm. As we all know, the body is the soul and the soul is the body as stated by Mojito. Huh? But, but seriously though, a similar concept to JJK about the soul is present in the One Piece world. For example, when Law swapped the Straw Hat soul in Punk Hazard, Sanji still had the same hockey levels. Even Mary's appearance is evidence to this where due to all the Straw Hat's feelings and emotions being imparted on the ship gave birth to her. Then this soul was able to heal the ship physically physically to arrive at Eni's lobby. But this is the moment when we see Garcia's true power. He squeezes Bonnie to make some Bonnie juice, but Sanji ain't letting this slide, so he jumps with a kick only to get yeeted out by Garcia effortlessly. But the disrespect doesn't stop there, as Garcia activates his dojutsu, which is the same glare we saw used against the fodder marines last chapter. But luckily, Sanji and Bonnie have enough of a strong will to not have their heads explode. This this is an incredibly OP ability without any condition. So for balance reasons, there are clearly some limitations to this fruit, which could be the key in defeating Saturn. However, we can figure out some of the Uchi Oni's other powers through its myths where Saturn will spew poison at his opponents and spread horrid illnesses, which is said to be the main ability of this yokai. Furthermore, Saturn's glare ability is one of the Uchi Oni's powers of affecting people's souls through eyesight. But now, we gotta talk about the fat L Fraudzaru just took. Kizaru is completely out and has to apologize to Saturn because he got one-shotted by Luffy, which we have been saying for ages would be the result after Luffy finally uses his Conqueror's Hockey. Let's not forget, Luffy prior to this had to take on Rob Lucci in his awakened form, who he also bodied, then right after went against the Seraphims. Through this fight with Kizaru, Luffy didn't even use any of his island-destroying attacks, like his Bajrung. He barely used his advanced conqueror Zaki, and when he did, well, we all saw what happened. Know your f place, trash. The only reason Luffy is out of gear 5 juice right now is because Kizaru with the Pika Pika no Mi is the fastest character in the series, which also means he's great at running away like a bitch. After reenacting the Tom and Jerry cartoon for like 5 chapters straight with Kizaru constantly on the run, Luffy's time was wasted, but not even the Gorosei will come to Kratzaru's defense as he says, this L from Nika was expected. Oh my god. God, the Admiral's stocks are like flatlining right now. Kizaru comes clean, saying that he has zero excuse for being notified by Luffy, and now he can't move at all. This might be because of the Star Gun having a kind of stun effect like in the old cartoons. Luffy had literally punched through Kizaru's brain and discombobulated him. After a character is hit with it, they start to see stars around their head, which signifies that they are stunned. This manifestation of Luffy's vision for the effects of his attacks 
once again showcases how he makes imagination into reality. In other words, Kizaru is out of the fight for a while, but so is Luffy. And Saturn sees this as a great opportunity to take care of the deadliest threat to the government in the past 800 years. Like, Luffy's importance to the Gorosei is so much that Saturn casually just ignores the main reason for his presence in the egghead in the first place, being Vegapunk and goes straight to kill Luffy. But Frankie is there to save the day and rescues Luffy at the last second. Seeing one of the highest authorities in the world go after the head of his captain makes Frankie realize that they are truly a crew of an emperor now, which means that the importance in supporting their captain to the best of their abilities is bigger than ever. And even Garcia acknowledges the might of Luffy's crew by giving them a compliment. Then Saturn says something very interesting. Why, when humans are told not to do something, they do it anyways. Once again, Saturn is hinting at the fact that he isn't human. From calling his soldiers mere replaceable insects to maggots, this dude sees himself as being built different. Now, there is always a possibility that the Gorosei are an actual race of devils, but a more logical explanation is that Jay Garcia's soul and mind has melded together with the Oceone's will. We all know since Eni's lobby that when a zone user eats their fruit, they start to exhibit traits of the said animal. Awakening means that you become one with the fruit and sometimes when you can't overpower or play along with its will, you end up being consumed by it. Like with Chopper's monster point pre-time skip or the jailers in Impel Down. With Saturn being such an old man, likely spanning centuries through the immortality surgery, it's no wonder the devilish will of the Ushi Oni has blended together with his mind, giving him a sense of being above or different from the other humans. There is also an idea of how the zone fruits will and its users become completely in sync, resulting in the awakening and the perfection of the devil fruit. Furthermore, Saturn and like all the other Goroseis are celestial dragons who see themselves as gods among the other races. They dehumanize everyone other than them, which allows the celestials to hunt, enslave, pillage the world with no moral qualm. To them, it's no different than a spider eating a fly. So Saturn grabs Bonnie and squeezes her as she screams out that he killed her dad, leading Saturn to tell us that Kuma is actually part of the Buccaneer race, a people who once committed a crime in the past. They are really strong and often pretty big thanks to the blood of the giants running through their veins. A traumatized Bonnie in this horrible situation thinks back to the words of her father, who told her about Nika, the warrior of liberation who danced into battle and would one day come and free her too. Now though Sun God Nika is literally right there, he pretty much can't do nothing. However, Kuma telling his daughter that he too wants to be a liberator like Nika is a foreshadowing that the Kuma that just ran away from the red line from Akainu is heading right towards Egghead Island to save his daughter. Either that or Kuma just pretty much imparted his soul, wisdom and literally memories onto the ancient robot which just awakened. Remember guys, this robot will fulfill the role that Vegaforce was supposed to, which was sending Sunny to the moon. <laughs> well, at least for them to get far away enough into the sky so they can literally fly off towards Albaf. But Bonnie thinking about her father leads us back 47 years ago into the Sorbet Kingdom when a young baby Kuma was born into a normal family, except for the fact that his dad was a buccaneer, making him a mixed breed. His tragedy started when his blood test was leaked to the world government. Like the Lunarians, Imu wanted to make sure every race that was linked to Joy Boy and the ancient kingdom was eradicated. The Buccaneers was no exception. In fact, the name Buccaneers are associated to pirates and possibly were once adventurers during the void century. Either way, this unfortunately causes Kuma's entire family to be captured by the world government. Tragically, as a toddler, Kuma was raised as a slave and forced to do extremely heavy labor and was constantly being threatened to be killed just for crying. Here we get to see the real conditions of slave life in Merijoa, where the celestials are treating them as playthings, comparing one to another, all to see which one is better. And because Kuma and his parents had different masters, the chances to meet each other were limited. However, Kuma, despite being a kid, tries to reassure his dad by saying that his master is so nice and that he's so lucky to have him, when in reality, that's simply not the case. But things just keep 
getting worse as Kuma would reach his breaking point with the news of his mother's passing. Something very impactful said by Kuma's father here is how his wife has gone to heaven. She is in a better place. We have been told over and over again that Mary Joa is the pinnacle of this world. This is where the gods reside and is supposed to be the holy land or heaven. Yet for these slaves who also have to call Mary Joa home by force is the very opposite. After nearly giving up on life, his father tells Kuma of the warrior of liberation and how he will come to save him one day. In the tribe of the Buccaneers, the name of Nika was passed down as they believed that he will one day bring everyone to the free ocean under the one sun. <laughs> Doesn't this sound familiar to the Madame Charlie prophecy or the Coming of Dawn poem by Toki? Even the ancient Lily spoke of the dawn. But again, the theme of these targeted races follows the preservation of Nika's legend. King is a prime example, who being last of his race, never forgot the prophecy and kept it alive to the present day. This is another hint that Kuma's race was heavily connected to Joy Boy and the ancient kingdom, perhaps being in his crew as well. Regardless, the story the story of Nika doesn't really help as it gets him killed. Come on, this kid can't catch a break. Go kill me with this. Sh Just because he was making too much noise, his father was shot in front of Kuma's eyes. Honestly, Kuma's backstory is one of the saddest yet. I can't even lie by saying that I did not cry. And those of you who watched the live stream would have known how emotional it got. The freaking celestial dragon kills him, man. Freaking heck, man. I'm pissed off. I hate this. I hate them, man. I, I freaking hate Oda, bro. However, the pinnacle of misery for those deemed less by the Celestials is revealed to us a few years later in God Valley. It turns out that the Celestials have a tournament every three years called the Population Eradication Tourney. Who would have guessed? Like, think of the worst sh anyone can do. Yeah, it's basically, they hit the mark for everything. And knowing Oda, he is trying to make it as soft as possible because this is a general manga for everybody, guys. So you can't really explore the freaking disgusting levels that these devils are bathing in. But the key marker is that this is the same year when the infamous rocks fought Garp and Roger. But now we actually get a preface to what went down and what caused rocks to attack. God Valley was a simple style standalone island in the West Blue. They weren't even part of the government which made them an independent state. Unfortunately, this meant they were not recognized as a protected nation or even a legitimate country. And because they shamelessly took their name of God Valley, they defiled the celestial dragons. How? Well, only they have the monopoly of the term God in the One Piece world. So, to follow their tradition, the upper echelon of the Celestials chose it to be the playground for their culling sport. Now, this tournament is quite self-explanatory. They go into the island and hunt humans to see who gets the most kills. The victims, of course, object to being killed. But with the might of the government, their pleas are heard by nobody. This is instantly depicted with the king of the island being one-shot by none other other than Saint Figal and Garling, who we later know was the champion at God Valley. Apart from being a god's knight, Garling is a ladies man, likely having the Riz Riz fruit. My guy has a bunch of girls following him around. He's like a celebrity to be honest. Bro, and gosh damn, he's lady, kind of wow. sexy. That hair is like some Ace Ventura shit. <laughs> I can't take him seriously. However, killing the king without the tournament being started had indeed actually given Garling minus 1000 points, which he just says is the perfect number of handicaps for the other contestant. <laughs> Knowing he actually was the champion goes to show how strong he is. But we're us seeing a younger version of Garling. This basically confirms our theory that Shanks was cloned. Stop the cap. <laughs> All right, maybe not cloned. He is Shanks's father. Without that big ass moon shaped hair, you can't tell me he doesn't look exactly like Shanks. He is him. The presence of Shanks's father also gives us clarification to Whitebeard's statement on his scars when he stated it aches as he sees Shanks's face. This whole setup lines up with the idea that Rox D. Zebek found out that the Celestial Dragons were conducting this disgusting game at God Valley. Pretty much nearly all of Zebek's crew had a history with the government.
government. Whitebeard's country couldn't pay tribute and ended up being constantly attacked. Likewise, Kaido's country ended up selling him because of this too. Roxwell, he wanted to grab a big score and become the next king of the world. What better way than to declare war on the current rulers and also nab their tournament prizes. In fact, we see six chests being presented as the prizes for the winners of this tournament. These boxes look awfully similar to the devil fruit boxes we have seen in One Piece. This thematically circles back to Doflamingo who reinstated the Colosseum games with the prize of a devil fruit. Though he wasn't welcome back at Marijawa, he always saw himself as a celestial dragon and kept this tradition alive. Now, it's possible that these boxes hold mythical fruits which we have have seen throughout the story. Like the Azor dragon fruit Big Mom gave to Kaido of the God Valley. Kaido possessing Yamato's fruit can also be explained by these boxes. Similarly, Whitebeard could have given Marco his phoenix fruit. Even Ivankov, Kuma and Dragon's fruit might have originated from this tournament. Oh yeah, did I forget to mention, the revolutionary's origin story also starts here. We learn this after the news of a young Kuma's escape is passed down to another person. A younger version of Gordo say Saturn. Wait, wait. He looks exactly the same. Gotcha, bitch. Which, of course, goes to show it's a confirmation that every member of the Gordo say had the immortality surgery done. Likely, each of them gained immortality as the final step of coronation to be part of Imu's inner circle. But we also know that they weren't exactly from the same era as Imu and Joy Boy, as they stated that the Nika fruit is even a legend to them. Regardless, the news of Kuma's breakout was not not only a big no-no because he is, you know, a buccaneer, and his existence itself is a direct offense to Imu's secret, the Void Century. But Kuma is also one of the prizes for this tournament. Someone give this kid a break. No. No, I don't think I will. Turns out Kuma was trying to escape this fate where 10 slaves had been set out on the island and if he had managed to escape, their lives would have been instantly cut short. But don't worry guys because Emporio Ivankov is here to the rescue. Just as he liberated the people of Impel Down, he had planned to do the same as a young boy because it turns out that Ivankov was also a slave. But he excused a positive spirit telling everyone that he's gonna live and so he asks Kuma if he wants to join them. Alongside Eva, we also see a slave girl named Ginny who is eating a giant slab of meat. Now, <laughs> the entire community thinks that this is Luffy's mother just cause she's eating meat? I bet you're all forgetting that I too can eat meat. Does this mean I'm Luffy's mother? <laughs> Come on, it's so obvious that this girl is Bonnie's mom as she looks like her and is eating the meat the same way Bonnie does when she was introduced. Her name also isn't too far off from Bonnie's and Kuma and her meeting so early on, well yeah, yeah the love story begins here. Also, she looks to be more like 7 to 9 years old, whilst Dragon at this point is 17. Ivankov is 15 and she calls him older brother. Kuma is at a closer age being 9. So unless Dragon is, you know, into pre-ordering Ginny, being Luffy's mom doesn't make sense. FBI, open up! <laughs> but something that does make sense is the embers of the revolutionary army being formed during this time. Even Ivankov's line during Impel Down about the flower of friendship can even bloom in hell makes sense after this chapter, where this lifelong bond between the starting revolutionaries was formed in God Valley, even including Dragon. Yep, Dragon being a young marine came to God Valley with his father and saw the heinous crimes being committed by the world government. He helped free Ivankov Vankov, Jini and Kuma, leading them to form a flower of friendship even in hell. We also know from the SBS that Kuma does become free as Oda depicts him carrying a lump sum of logs whilst reading a book called Nidokin. So this God Valley flashback is gonna be big. And if you guys want to learn everything about Rox D's Bex crew who had attacked God Valley, then make sure to watch this video next.